Alright, I've even got my little timer here, so I promise I will not be longer than 20 minutes. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, Peter, for introducing me, and thank you, Jeff, for, for allowing us, me and Moira, to be here. So I'm a founder of a not-for-profit charity in the Gold Coast called Coaching with Substance. And um, we won Best, best Not-for-Profit in 2014 um, because of a couple of really great initiatives that we're doing in the community. Now, I'm a number one best-selling author on Amazon. Everyone knows Amazon? Yes. Beautiful. So at any given moment, there's about three million books there. For me to make number one is a very big effort. And um, I guess when I'm thinking about the reason why my books catapulted to number one is because addiction is a hot topic. Yeah? We all agree? Yeah. It's, it's, this is how hot it is. Um, out of... Um, so there's 30 categories, I made it to number one. Um, so that was really my major achievement. And the reason why it's, it's such a hot topic is because the Global Burden of Disease Study did a study on 291 diseases in 187 countries. And they found that addiction and mental illness issues is what out of the 291 diseases? The big, Any guesses? The big, almost, number five. Okay, so 291 diseases, it's not just 10, not just five countries, 181 countries, and they found addiction mental illness to be number five. So there are a lot of people in grave addiction, and I'm one of them. And the reason why I've put my books in the table in front of you, so everyone's got a little copy there, um, is, is because, um, let's have a little look at the blurb just to, because I get very nervous about this, because <laughs> this was one of the most vulnerable moments that I've had in my life, and what gave way to me quitting a very illustrious career in drug taking, most especially methamphetamine, is, um, is the writing of this book. And it, it happened because, there's another book in there, sorry, so I met um, three years ago, I was in so much trouble. I was held hostage. I was put in a trunk of a car and all sorts of things happening. And um, I met this, this mum called Monsu. And I, I, I was in tears and I said to my friend, please, you know, I really just, I just want to turn away from this. I've been institutionalized 10 times. Um, you know, it's not for, it's not a great story. And we'll read the first paragraph in a moment. Um, but really, I guess, the reason why I wrote my book is not because I'm proud of what happened, but because there is an addiction epidemic out there. And I needed to inspire the people. I wrote this specifically for people with addiction issues. It is for people currently in active addiction so that they can really kind of be inspired by my story. Because now I've have, I run a not-for-profit charity. I'm doing my doctorate. I finished my master's in public health at Queensland Alcohol Drug Research Education Centre at UQ. They've got a, a division in Kirsten that studies the effects of alcohol and drug problems. Um, so let me just read to you, and everyone, there's a copy in front of you if you want to look at the back, please do. So let me just read to you the first, the blurb at the back, just so you can get an idea. And let me warn you, this is not going to be good. <laughs> Um, so Maria started or travelled on a plane alone at 11 years of age to come to Australia. She started drinking at 13 and began smoking crystal meth at 15 years old. By 18, she was selling her body for a living and spent her 20s in a modelling day, dabbling with marijuana, cocaine, ecstasy and LSD. Alone and confused, she thought she had it all, while partying with socialites, fashionistas, politicians, celebrities and hardened criminals. Her bipolar frenzy took her to 129 cities, working in any capacity to support her bad vices and crazy lifestyle until one day she finally decided enough. So this book was written to inspire the readers of the soul's capacity to change. The stories of guilt, humiliation, dishonor, indignity, shame and, and all that were told with courage and in brutal honesty. It impresses upon you that a happy ending is available to anyone who seeks to find it and works hard to maintain it. And thus became my life. I'm thinking, okay, well, here I am, very broken, 
how did it, I'm not really sticking to this anymore. <laughs> so how did it begin? What happened? Addiction starts with a painful childhood. That's really where it stems. I've been working with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of clients now, and it stems from a painful childhood. And I wanted to inspire the people out of their addiction because when I say billions of people, it's true because one in five have an addiction issue. One in five have a dependence to addiction. So we are soothing, we are a sick society, and we're soothing. We're going into the arms of alcohol and opiates and heroin and meth because of the, the, the things that happen in childhood. So only one in five. So I believe all the people in the room are probably the four <laughs> that are helping the community and doing great things. But there are one in five out there that are in a very bad place. And we can see it. I don't need to sell to you the problem of addiction. The global burden of disease already did the study. Out of 291 diseases, it's number five, okay? And my story is so common. It happens, it so happens that the person oh, that rang your president, Maura, is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, also shared the same fate. So her, her father, killed himself with alcoholism when she was in her mid-twenties. So we're working together now and we're really out there reaching out to the people that don't know who to turn to and how, you know, I'm role modeling to them. That no matter how degrade, degrading or no matter how hurtful or what things happen to you, you can turn it around, you can still become a doctor. I can still become, finish my doctorate in about a year and a half. I should be finished. I've done my masters. I give to hundreds of people. Um, every year are the number of clients that I service one-on-one -on -one, and I coach them. I sit down with them and I emulate my life in front of them and I say, hey, what have you done? If they say, I've been in trouble with the cops, I go, Ooh, yeah, I've done that too. I've been a sex worker, Ooh, yeah, done that too. I've done stripping, yep, yeah, done that too. I've been in so many jobs, yep, I've had like 200 odd jobs and I've been living on my own since I was 11, supporting my own self. So. Luckily, every situation that was given to me is so that, I mean, I wouldn't think it then, but it was so that when people present themselves with their addiction issues to me, there is a point of knowing what to do because I got myself out of that. Kidnapping, check. <laughs> Domestic violence, check. Sexual abuse, check. Abandoned by, by mom and dad and not given an education, check, 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 check. You know, every single drugs, alcohol, methamphetamine, cocaine, speed, all sorts of things, I've done it all. And I've been in the, um, you know, gallivanting with triads and Yakuza and Cabramatta gangsters and you name it. I've seen it all. And I think, well, what is all that? What is all that for me? So when I wrote my book, didn't think it was going to be number one bestseller. I just wrote and wrote and wrote for eight weeks full time. I was, um, and this was the second, third book that I wrote um, because this was when I was already better. So the, the monk was helping me, I was meditating every day, doing yoga, training my body so that I am not so helpless and I don't feel so um, uh, bad when I'm around men because I felt like, you know, I put myself in situations where I victimized and degraded my own body. So I started working out, doing yoga, eating well, doing all the things that I should have been doing had I had parents to teach me what these things were and are, you know. Um, yeah, so there's two books there. So once kill your addiction before it kills you. The other one is Sit with Monk Sue. So these two books became number one bestsellers on Amazon. The third book that I wrote is Kill Their Addiction Before It Kills All of You. And that's specifically written for the parent or the loved one. The mother, the father, the son, the daughter, the brother, the sister. How they can walk and journey with the person in addiction in their life and how they can help them. And the fourth book that I wrote is From Rock Bottom, The Sky's the Limit. How to Become a Recovery Coach in Six Months or Less. So I've really used all the experience. I'm almost 40. <laughs> I made it. <laughs> yeah. And um, I think one of, I forgot his name, he was saying that I was in the paper. Yeah, I've been in the paper. I've been in, um, you know, interviewed on the radio, podcasts were done about my life. And I really am here to inspire people in addiction issues. But it doesn't matter what you've been through. None of that matters. What matters is 
the future that you can carve upon yourself. If you just decide to get yourself well, I can help you. And that was, that's the message for this book. So I'm hoping that people here tonight can, can help donate. You know, it's 35 at Dimux, and, and you know, we're selling it today, the two for 50, or just there's just a donation box there if you wanted to. But really what I wanted to get from all these esteemed people like yourselves is there's a little collaboration form in front of you. If you don't have it, just let me know. But all I know is such distinguished people like yourselves, if you're a lawyer or a doctor or a you know, politician, I don't know who's here tonight, if you know of anyone, is there a way that you can be a referral source for a charity? So if everyone can just grab this one, there should be one in front of you. Yeah. So is there a, a book that we can co-write together? You know, is there, are you in the legal field? And is there stories of addiction that you know that we can come help come to the fore? Um, do you want to be interviewed about any of the things that we do for, for people with addiction issues? Would you like to help us fundraise the book so that the story of inspiration can be put in the hands of people that need to know that just because what they're experiencing now is not optimum, it need not stop there. As long as there's breath, as long as there's life, there can be changes that we can do together. Uh, we've got movie <coughs> screenings that we're doing, quite really good documentaries. Is there a way that the Rotary Club can volunteer, you know, with, with our not-for-profit organization? We do have tax-deductible gift recipient status. Um, would you like to sponsor a person's journey to recovery because we're always looking for sponsors uh, as well um, yeah would you like to buy a book or however it is that you can help us please do fill this out because we'd love to have you help us and join us in our little um, thing because we, we do have so many people that have uh, addiction issues so now there is one last little note that I wrote about and I didn't cover is um, so uh, a quote by Dr. Gabo Mate. Does anyone know Gabo Mate? He's a renowned addiction expert. And he says that we gauge our social growth or our social evolution <coughs> by the number of people in our society abusing alcohol and drugs. Because it is such a tangible look at, at, at ourselves as a human species, to be born into such a a miraculous kind of body and still have that like the potential kind of just some some people make a choice to just not recognize any of that so if our social evolution is 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 gauged by the number of people that are wiping their potential then we must not be very socially evolved you know so my job is to really work with people and really coach them work with them and also one more thing that I was doing when um, I was doing my masters in public health I really I had this little idea this is my last little story I had this idea I really wanted to measure how much are we drinking as a society or in the Gold Coast so here I am I'm in the Gold Coast it was three years ago I said I just want to know how much are we addicted is it really true what what I'm studying that can't be true let me see. So, um, so I, I, I'm 40 and I had long hair, so that's me at the front. Um, so I called up a promotions company and I said, oh, do you have any promotions job for alcohol sam sampling? And they said, yes, yes, we've got one at Dan Murphy's, you know, it goes for two months. You go and count how many people go to the counter and you offer them a, uh, a sample. Perfect. That saves me waiting in front of Dan Murphy's counting everything I'm getting paid. To count them. So here I am, I'm at the front. I started counting. 80 people would come in one hour. So 80 people in an hour, they would spend $50 average. Easy, easy. No doubt about it. So that's what? 4,000 people? Yeah, that's a $4,000. Yeah. So I can did a calculation here, and of course I lost my thing. So that would be, there you go. $50 average, that makes 4,000 an hour one branch of Dan Murphy's makes in a one hour. You, you divide it by eight hours, because that's how much they trade. So that's about 35,000 per day. 
Multiply that by the nine schools of Dan Murphy's. That's about 288,000 in alcohol sales a day, just in the Gold Coast. <laughs> so you multiply that by 10, why? Because there's Dan Murphy's, there's BWS, there's the pubs, there's um, the nightclubs, you know. So we're spending $8.4 million in 30 days for an open seven day a week at Dan Murphy's and all the other associated alcohol companies. That's with my own hand, I saw it <laughs> with my own hand. So 8.4 million, so that means in a year, that's an $84 million trade in the Gold Coast only. You multiply that by how many cities there are in our country and that's why they say it's a billion dollar industry. Now, there's a thing that I, here we go. Last thing is the cost of tobacco and alcohol and illicit drug abuse to Australians. Okay, so this was our little text when I was doing my master's in public health in the field of alcohol, tobacco and drugs. Collinson Lapsley were kind enough, this is the summary by the way, <laughs> this is the summary of the cost of alcohol, drug and, and um, illicit drug use. Deaths are here uh, and guess how much was spent in um, um, hospitals and, and, and absenteeism, productivity at work, all that, the whole thing. Guess how much in one year? How many billions of dollars? 50. 50, yes. 50. You got 50 there? <laughs> 56.1 billion dollars. Okay. One year. One year. 15 billion are on alcohol treatment, prevention, that type of thing. Tobacco, 31 billion for, for, for health insurances and health costs and operations. 8 billion for illicit drugs and yeah, so 56.1 billion. So there's no doubt there is an epidemic. I've got a growing industry that I'm servicing. The demand is great and what we're doing is we're training more recovery coaches so that we've got people that are peers that has got experience themselves. That, have, that has been through and can draw from domestic violence, can draw from sexual abuse, can draw from the use of alcohol, tobacco, and illicit drugs, and help the people that are wanting to get help. So, <laughs> thank you. Um, are there any questions? Oh, yes. Don? Isn't that an interesting story? It's all on the book. <laughs> um, because my mother and father uh, separated when I was five. And um, my dad is the eldest of 11 brothers and sisters. They're quite in poverty. And so, but my dad wouldn't let my mom have me. So every, no matter what my mom wanted to do, my dad wouldn't let me go to my mom's. And um, apparently, they kind of got my mom's money and the whole 11 brothers and sisters at that time used that money so that they can all get money so that they yeah and I was working at <laughs> 67 working and selling all sorts of trinkets and things to be able to eat um, while my mom gave money and then finally at 11 this is what my mom told me she um, her husband uh, Australia died and um, left a you know, a bit of a share for a company, so she had quite a bit of money. So she called my dad and said, hey, my husband <coughs> died, that means you can probably now go here, but just send my daughter here and um, I'll get you over. So my dad, quicker than anything, I was in Australia. Yeah, and, but my mom couldn't leave because of if she left, then her citizenship, all that would not happen. So she couldn't leave, so I was on, on a plane by myself at 11 years old. And I thought I was being sold off to something terrible. <laughs> it was terrible actually. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> the ice addiction today, what do you have any thoughts on it? Oh, many, many. I work with, I mean, even my last ice use was three years ago. So, <coughs> what thoughts would you like? <laughs> well, is, is it containable or is it just going to go preserve? That's the hard one. It, it is containable, but we, we all have to act. We all, we, each and every single one of us would need to do our bit, whether it's, you know, 
to getting people like me to just do free coaching to everyone and just supporting a place where they can go to heal and meditate and do yoga and do holistic therapies because having them, giving them a drug to get off the drugs is not helping them at all. And that's not what I espouse and that's not what we do in the century that we have. Do you have referrals from other agencies, like domestic violence agencies that would perhaps prefer your services or vice versa? It's the problem they... The system is the system. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. Um, and, and yeah, it's just a different thing, you know. They, that's why I'm doing my doctorate, so yeah. that I can measure and say, hey, this is just as effective, if not more effective, just so I can show. I mean, there's so much um, literature and research on metaphysical, which is what more is a metaphysical healer, um, and, and non pharmacological approaches to getting well. Uh, and that's what we espouse, you know, body training. You have to exercise daily. So we have the gym and we, we train them that way and there's yoga and tai chi, chi and all sorts of things. So we're a long way away, I'm afraid. Yeah. Stuart? What's your thoughts on <coughs> legalising some of the drugs? Well, look, that's 31 billion on tobacco. It's legal. That's how much we spend on it. And illicit is 8 billion. So there's my thoughts on that. Eight billion for for illicit, and because tobacco and alcohol are illegal, 31 and 35, whatever that is, 40, 50, you know, how many billion is for the legal? If it's legal, remember my thing about Dan Murphy's, how much was being spent? That's what happens when it's legal. It becomes available to everyone and for all. So you would be against legalizing marijuana? I don't know what to say about that. I'll just work with people <laughs> whether, you know, the lobbying or that, I'll leave it to the hands of the lobbyists. I think I just want to work with the people that want help and just help them as much as I can. Yeah. I'd like to call on uh, Gordon for the vote of thanks, please. <laughs> Marie, I'd like to congratulate you on the way you've turned your life around. I think you're doing great work and I hope you can continue. I hope this little token you might be able to use to write your notes on. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and hopefully we'll be able to help you out. Yes, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, Maury, would you like to join me? More or less. <laughs> Peter, do you want to go? Yes. Is this going to go online? Oh, yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, <laughs> On you can hold it up like that <laughs>